So uh, welcome everybody to uh, this afternoon's seminar with the Inclusion, Diversity and Identities Research Network here at Edge Hill. It's great to have you with us. And today we're delighted to welcome Dr. Kapinda Lali from the University of Wolverhampton to present a seminar entitled, You Have to Start with a Seed, a Case Study of School Food Education at Ingalls Academy, which sounds like a fascinating piece of work, Kapinda. So thank you very much for joining us. I'll just say a, a quick word or two about uh, how the session, how these sessions normally work. So my name is Peter Hick, I'm Professor of Inclusive Education here at Edge Hill. I'll be chairing the, the session today. And then my colleague, uh, Dr. Christina Donovan, uh, who is senior lecturer here at the Faculty of Education, is kindly offered to act as a discussant. So Gapinda will give a presentation for about 30, 40 minutes. And then uh, Christina will, will start us off by responding to his uh, presentation and um, presenting some, some questions as food for thought for us all. If you have any uh, points you'd like to make, you're very welcome to post them in the chat space or put up your hand after Kapinda's talk and we'll call you in, invite you to unmute and, and pose your question yourself and we can have an open discussion on the session due to finish at 1.30. And um, my colleague, Dr. Anna Maragudi, who co-leads the research network here, will be keeping an eye on the chat space and uh, will be recording the presentation, but I think not the discussion, Anna, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So um, I'll just say a, a quick word about Kapinda. So Dr. Kapinda Delali is a reader in Education for Social Justice and Inclusion at the School of Education at the University of Wolverhampton. He's co-director for the Centre for Research in Education and Social Transformation there. And he's currently the author of about five books, editor-in-chief of the European Journal of Education and a member of the Bira Council, uh, amongst many other roles. And uh, I have to say, I first came across Kapinda's work through his involvement as a convener for the sociocultural theory special interest group at Bira. So he, he, he has a wide, uh, a wide range of interests. So I think that's enough for me for now. And uh, so Gapinda would like to invite you to uh, share your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to, to come along today to, to talk about my research. And so, yeah, essentially, this is one of many projects that I've been involved in in, in working on and I wanted to kind of talk about this particular one case study project at Ingalls Academy um, today just to give a quick overview the broad interests are around social justice inclusion and education so my, well, in terms of my research and um, focus it's largely been around qualitative research case study design and ethnography in education so those are the areas which interest me most and that i've been trained up in essentially and it started with a phd at university of leicester which was on which was on school meals itself not so much on the calorific interests but on the social aspect of dining um and how it you know how, how the school meals school meal can be used as a potential space for learning um, for education essentially uh, as a teaching occasion um, and there's a you know just a bit of a context there uh, this idea that in, developed in the Sweden in Sweden in the 1970s around the pedagogic meal um, so using the lunch hour as a teaching occasion essentially I think however it extends beyond that um, food is a great vehicle for, I guess, creating conversations around growing, sustainability, eating, feeding, preparing food, and how, you know, how, how inequalities are playing out today as well. Underpinning my work is very much a sociological focus, um, whilst this project is much more geared around food education. Uh, what, what interests me is this idea that school food policy is classed, it's gender disracialized, and I, I'd like to unpack those debates 
uh, around that, that narrative essentially. So this particular project, you'll see, you can see on the image here, um, this is taken from the school itself. This is actually a polytunnel. It's a school that's based in uh, in Lincolnshire. Uh, and I've got the permission from the teacher to, to, to mention, but a pseudonym of, I created the pseudonym of Ingalls Academy to name the school. And that is from one of the, um, the, the, the plant, one of the names of a plant that was grown in the school actually. So that's just to protect the identity for publication purposes, but there's nothing controversial here in that sense. This is actually, a, I guess, a good example, a good case study example of how food education can work. What is the place of food in school is what I ask. And I also ask, um, what does good food education look like? And how do we create a whole school food approach? Um, and this is a polytunnel that the school's got access to quite a lot of land. It, it is a state school and is a primary academy. Um, really fascinating, though. I, I remember um, the head teacher picking out a tomato from here and just asking me to try one. And uh, yeah, I think it's quite powerful when you get, you know, when you get children to, to get involved in, in the growing and preparing a food it's amazing what they will try so the, the, the impact on eating behaviors is huge the impact on experiences of food and interactions with them is huge um, just anecdotally my experience of, of school meals was not great a, lot, a number of people I speak to um, also report from a UK perspective I guess that the school meal experience was quite hectic um, and I'd like you to kind of reflect on yours as as we as I walk through the presentation, essentially. So, um, yeah, again, the title it's inspired by a conversation I had with a head teacher, who's very passionate about food education himself. And I remember him saying that I was asking him. I said, "Look, how do you do all this?" You know, I was kind of listing all the all the blockers, if you like, and said, "Look, in an inner, inner city school, how do you?" How are you going to grow food? They got the land, they got that space to work with. You haven't got access to local produce. And then he showed me what is being growing inside the school as well. Um, it was fascinating. And I think what was coming through there was this idea that we discuss, we always talk about a bottom up approach and its importance and having those voices, which is absolutely critical. But without the buy in from the leadership, without the buy in at that level, it's very difficult to enact that change. Um, and I think so, I think pressure is going to come from both sides, essentially. That was quite interesting. Um, yeah, there was, it's, you know, his response to me when I, when I mentioned those blockers was that actually, you know, he said you have to start with a seed, you know, and I think that was more metaphorically meant uh, and, and so, you know, as it was literal, but um, that you know, he did a piece of PhD research himself, actually, on school leaders and food education. So really, really interesting to to work with with the head teacher there, because that's the other thing. Um, keeping involved and, and, and spending lots of time in schools has been really insightful. Um, and if I talk, if I bring this, bring this debate back to inequality just to get that contextual view. Um, the, the, the debate around free school meals has a strong policy pull, which we all know, um, and there's debates for and against universalising of free school meals. There's just children who are missing out and going hungry. They're not quite eligible for free school meals, um, but, but they, should well, they should be essentially because they can't afford to eat, so there doesn't there's an issue with the system there. Um, in schools today, some of the schools where I visited, I'll still see children queuing up separately, those who are on free school meals versus those who are not. In some schools, that the systems are much more advanced in the sense that we've got a, a fingerprint system or an electronic card reader where you can't really d distinguish who's on free school meals who isn't. During lunch breaks, some children want to go off. We're talking about all through school now up until secondary even. 
some children, pupils, want to go off and spend time with their friend, their peers, friends at lunchtime. Um, and they often go hungry at lunch because if they're on free school meals, they're not obviously accessing food from the school. And when they go off site, they ain't got money to buy food. So there's some exclusionary issues there. And, you know, there's obviously competing debates there. You know, for example, I've got that privilege. I can, I can afford to, I've got two young children, right? Two, two girls, six and 10 years old. I can afford to feed them because I've got the privilege. So I prefer that that money to go to somebody who needs it. But equally, other debate is if we can feed our prisoners, why can't we feed our kids? If we can feed patients in the hospital, you know, what are we doing about the future generations in, in schools? A school is another institution similar to that of a hospital, similar to that of a prison setting, essentially, in the, in terms of the in terms of its the organization. So I just wanted to kind of provide that context there because I think it's really important to keep that in mind, those ideas in mind when we think about food and, and why I've been able to develop such broad and distinct projects, but ultimately pedagogy. I'm very, I'm very interested in pedagogy. Um, I'm very interested in food education. And I've used teacher training, uh, a teacher training space as a platform to, to shout to shout about the importance of of meal time, um, and as a result of that, this this is a, this is a project I com completed after my PhD. Essentially, is a few years ago now, and and I set up three research questions. The first one was very much about how does a school approach food and the nutrition education in re in relation to learning and integrating food in school life. What does it look like? I want our teachers, school leaders, and people's perspectives on the effectiveness of food in school life. Given that it was a case study, I very much spent the time talking to those individuals. And third, what, what are the factors that affect food and nutrition education? Um, relatively small, small scale case study, which was conducted between 2020 and 2022. There are other projects that preceded that and have succeeded that as well. So I'm going to mention. The current project I'm involved in, in the latter part of the presentation. I'm happy for you guys to follow up with me as well, and I can ask, ask any questions or answer, answer them. 16 semi structured interviews, seven staff online, nine people's face to face because it was during COVID. And interviews lasted anywhere between 15 and 40 minutes. I want to move straight into the data. Um, I, I quite, so, given that I'm, I'm really much, much in invested in qualitative research i'm interested in the richness i'm interested in perspectives going beyond the headline data beyond the statistics um which i don't disregard because they don't lie but um i like to find out the why you know ask the question why so the way i've kind of tried to structure this is just around the research questions essentially and then i'll move into talking about impact and essentially this is one case study example. There's not many in the you know in, in England in particular, actually. Um, and I think it's good to, to showcase what good practice looks like, you know. Um, and you know what does and, and I started by kind of questioning what does food education actually mean because we have to think of food in isolation to this to, to school meals and lunch because it's got that policy pull. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that we all do, but you know, for the lay audience, if you like, what is the place of food in school and generally around feeding? Well, I think it's, when, I, when I spoke to the Early Years Foundation stage lead, they thought it was much more than that. In this school, I think it's a much broader term that encapsulates growing food, cooking, eating, teaching the children about the importance of a healthy, balanced diet and about what you put inside your body and how it affects, affects you and affects the outside. The head teacher spoke about food education quite passionately um, and talked about the health aspect of it, which is, the, which is the more straightforward connotation, but also spoke about culture. It opens children's experience to different cultures and, and using food as a way to engage with other cultures around the world, because it can open up to that door to learning. Also has the element of the social side to it, and I, and I prodded a little bit there and I asked, can you tell me more? 
uh, and then you mentioned it's about bringing people together. When I when I kind of prodded more on the social aspect, which was of interest, obviously, the head teacher mentioned uh, halfway through that paragraph there, it's about bringing people together. Most of the children here now are having their lunch and sitting around and talking with their lunches. But also the aspect of bringing communities together as well. And that was very much where you saw local community members coming in, parents, you know, um, and, and schools build a real reputation around around food for that reason. They've got their own chef, um, they grow their own food, and I've tried the meals there myself. So, um, yeah, very nutritious. But I think that, that social aspect of it is, is very interesting in terms of how much it can be involved, how much children can be involved. So they've got they've got a kitchen area just for just for the children, um, and the, the way they've been built, the purpose purpose built. So they're much lower in terms of the worktops, the ovens and everything. Um, really fascinating. So again, on on food education, what it what what is meant? Um, it's the a key stage one teacher spoke about this and said, food education is to me, uh, to me is giving the children the opportunity to explore food. With our taste ed work, which I'll mention shortly, they use their senses to explore different fruits and vegetables. So taste education is a food education charity where I was a, um, I, I, I was a, I was affiliated with taste education um, on the kind of on the advisory board, um, and I continue to to keep in touch. So, they provide free resources to schools essentially and lesson plans, and it's about eating, exploring different ways of eating, a uh, very unique style, where they use headset to block out sound, um, and then you know, eating through the senses. So children who might not typically eat. <laughs> Certain vegetables will more than likely try them because sometimes they don't like the way they sound or smell or taste. So that's very fascinating work. And um, I'll mention the web the, the website's mentioned later. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's very important to, to to I guess refer to those resources. And that you know, and I think that's. It. There's an academic, there's, an, there's, an, there's some intellectual work that goes on in unpacking food education as a concept, but also how is that being operationalized in the everyday? Uh, I'm very much interested in, in sharing those ideas and resources. So they see where food comes from. They learn how to grow it, how to use it, and then how to cook it as well. Life skills, it's that holistic nature of it. It's not just looking at, at this, it's how we cook. Um, the practical experience of cooking and tasting within school are key. But it's not the whole picture. So the food education program covers a number of things, from understanding the journey, um, from growing it, but also including livestock and dairy produce. So we look at all food and teach the children the whole picture. And they've got a food education lead there. And as you can see, you know, food can be taught not just through food education as a subject, but through through you know through math, literacy, through history, through science, geography, um, even a business, and and the list goes on. The science lead spoke about how to me, food education is about helping children to develop an enjoyment of food, um, develop their understanding of the social context within which eating takes place, as well as developing their understanding of different types of food where it comes from so clearly i was reaching some kind of saturation here where you know similar things are being said um the importance of different food types linking in with the healthy choices and the scientific reasoning behind that as well as how they grow into young adults so there's a biological function of course i think it's still important to say there is I'm just going to go back there. Enjoyment of food. Quite often, we're led to draw binaries around good food, good or bad foods. Um, research suggests, and the way we, I've written, 
in the past and the research that has informed our paper um that children should be able to leave a life you know lead a life of choice um you know just to have that kind of freedom to choose rather than constant policing and calorie counting you know of course there's a there is a food education piece at play and we do need to train and coach of course but it begins to outweigh some of the benefits sometimes socially where you know negative connotations around food can have an impact for the rest of your life those benefits can't always be seen and can't always be measured statistically but they can be through experience so that's where it becomes a little bit complex in terms of trying to persuade a policy audience um yeah so i think i, I guess that we need new data sets and evidence from both statistics and, and, and description. And the second, uh, the second part of the question, which was very much around perspectives of food in school life, each year group has a long-term food plan. So the plan for the year, skills-based, you know, so as you go through some more complex cooking techniques are learned, there's progression. Um, and also looking at different, you know, produce is grown and where they have a topic called African adventure. We look into transportation of fruits and where, you know, this ain't just during uh, Black History Month, for example. <laughs> look at dishes from other, you know, and, and things like that from different countries. So there's a real missed opportunity um, where you can use food to leverage so many different debates throughout the year, throughout the curriculum. Um, so yeah, it's really powerful. And, and, you know, food is everywhere, we, you know, everybody can always relate. So it allows, you know, it allows it to become so much, you know, it's because it's so topical, I think it's a good opportunity to, to, to take advantage of that. And the head teacher also mentioned, to, to use a bit of a cliche, you have to start with a seed, as the title suggests. That's probably literally, that's a paper I'm currently writing at the moment, following up from this project. Um, and you know, right, I'm writing that in, with, with I'm writing that with the collaboration with the head teacher actually, um, because that's the other thing about this type of research. It's got to come from the right voices. It's got to be representative, um, and that's how I've been able to keep a closeness. It's got the children's voices, the teachers, the head teachers. Um, so if children invest in the food that they are consuming in whatever way it is. We've done our special cheese making where children have made cheese from Renee and milk and whatever, and then tried different cheeses, for example. When they've cooked or done anything, we put copies of the recipes in, they write reviews in there. So if they like something, they can either write it or just draw a picture or a smiley face to say they've liked it. If they haven't, then they can put a not, not a, you know they can put a, not, not a smiley face, and they can put a, a comment in there if there's something they didn't like. So, you know, they begin to build up this picture really, and, and what they're doing is they're tapping into their emotions around the foods and they're processing those. You know, so again, I guess just anecdotally, you know, my my, my kids, um, I, I guess when they're involved in in baking cakes, sometimes at home, we you know might get a kind of uh, a starter kit to help you know, make it together and you know, they're much more likely to try it. Um, if they're, you know, when they go to the grandparents, we've got a greenhouse, you know, but they're kind of pulling out carrots, pulling out tomatoes, you know, I've seen them much more likely to try those things. Um, so, you know, obviously with the cakes, it's a quick, it's an easy sell, but fruits and vegetables too, I've, I've seen it where they're, they're physically, um, I guess preparing the food themselves and then seeing where it's come from. They've washed it, they've prepared it, they've helped to cook it, and you know that's and that's a great connection between you know building those relationships with, with with family, with friends, but also with the school grounds. So some schools we're now seeing vegetable patches, and when we see that, <coughs> the children recognise the power of the environment and, <coughs> and the importance of looking after the earth, essentially. So again, potential missed opportunities uh, where, where much more could be done. And this is, this is through my observations.
So we've gone. Excuse me. Some voices from the pupils. I talked to a few year four and five pupils. Uh, for the whole entire key stage, you can go into key stage, the big hall. You can do food education lessons. Uh, the last time, about a month ago, we had different foods and we got to choose, we got to smell them. Um, so, you know, they had a, they had a kind of a, a, a community day. <laughs> also, the second people mentioned growing at school and home is really fun. It's my grandma who normally gives me lots of plants to grow. We've got strawberries um, from a nanny because she's got her own allotment and she grows food there as, a lot as well. We grow pumpkins. We've got like, um, humong they've got humongous right now. We've picked them off. We grow a lot of flowers. And my mum normally really early in the morning picks them. She, she and goes to water them a lot. So it's about nurturing. It's about preparing. It's about looking after. There's that, there's that disciplinary element built in there where you're still getting that structure. Um, and also the chef's meals are really nice to eat. And this is the people talking about the chef in the school. Um, they're so healthy and stuff. The fact that we've got that we get to get them daily is really nice. For me, the favourite part is when you get to see how it's being made. A few years ago, we used to be able to see the food getting made, and it was really cool to see how you cooked it and put it in the oven. Um, and in terms of the, that third research question, so I've obviously only shared snippets here of each just to kind of give you a, a broad overview of, of what's what's coming through really um as i've been writing the paper as well i've only worked here but i can talk as a mother of a picky three-year-old um you know i think at home she's a very different kettle of fish i think children's involvement every single aspect that works for my little girl this year with grilled sweet corn for example and so this is beyond the school gates if you like you know um, children are involved in every single aspect, they're planting, they're turning the soil over, they're pulling the weeds up, they're watering it, they're nurturing, they're seeing how much they change and grow. Uh, and, and again, that's the whole school connection it is it was coming through quite strongly. You asked the third re research question, of course, I was just reading there. Um, and a couple of more points before I start moving on to some of the, the intellectual work here. Um, and the concepts. So the head teacher and science leaders, so they talk about, you know, so the head teacher is very strongly linked to projects in Finland, actually, um, works very proactively. So lessons being learned. Um, you've got good education in Finland, and that's what they're saying about children being safe. For a nation like that to put food as a core or one of the things that is expected in their education system, I found absolutely enlightening and exciting. That's what we need in this country because it will get worse before it gets better if we don't. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to get taught in the curriculum. But I do like to think it uh, with science is obviously a very key one. It's part of the curriculum. Um, cooking is very important, life skill. It's important to develop that literacy within mathematics as well, linking food with, with weighing. Um, so a lot of schools, you'll find it hard to fit it into the curriculum, but there's always a way to do it um, quite not, quite organically. Um, so here's a picture of the chef and one of the children picking the food out of the basket, having brought it from the from the school garden, the school farm itself. Um, in terms of the key concepts underpinning this research. So I'd like to think of this quite inductively and, and let the data do the talking, essentially. I think what was coming through for me was this idea of culinary capital, which I've written about as a monograph, um, which is one, one that kind of, so, yeah, this is partly one of the projects I wrote about in that monograph, and now I'm developing that paper, as I mentioned earlier. This idea of culinary capital plays on the work of Pierre Bourdieu, um, social and cultural capital. This idea that the focus particularly on individuals' food practices and how they are implicated in this process through the circulation of culinary capital. And it links to the work of Bourdieu, uh, who defines that cultural capital inflects one's identity and life chances. For instance, unhealthy food choices follow a socioeconomic gradient that explains what is meant by culinary capital. So for instance, um, 
you know, I'll, I'll often hear conversations between with children in, in you know during lunchtime and what they've eaten, where they've eaten, how they've eaten. They can quickly find themselves excluded. Not all not all children get to get to go abroad or go to the restaurants to try different foods or have access to those ingredients. Um, and you know that, that's this idea of culinary capital where it can really shape experiences. It can really instill conversation. The school food is quite powerful in the sense that you know when you go to the playground you choose who you play with right in during school lunch sometimes you might be sitting next to somebody you've never spoken to this this goes throughout the whole school period and there's a social but level of social competence that can be shaped um you know you're learning to speak to different people that you might not typically speak with and it's food that's bringing you together so the whole, you know, that that's a that's a key concept another one it's the idea of commensality. This involves eating at the same table with a broader definition. And while a broader definition is given by Solwell and Nelson, who suggests that commensality is eating with other people um, and both apply. So that's what I meant by this social aspect. A very, you know, it's, it's about that, convivi that conviviality, if you like. In the past decade, com commensality has been called upon by a number of scholars to help provide a platform of how things should appear in such settings, including schools. This idea that we shouldn't be patrolling and policing the school environment, we sh there should be much more opportunity to, to converse with pupils and children. Um, take that as an opportunity. So, for example, in, in, a, you know, in a, one of the projects I often experienced, um, teachers telling me that actually some of the children who, who are, you know, often don't get, often don't get words, many words out of them in class. They open up during lunchtime and has an impact on the afternoon behaviours and their engagement and, and that can be a pivotal part of the day. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's an interesting concept to play on as well. So that we, you know, decide that thinking of food as a positive, thinking of the meal time as not just a conveyor belt style, because in a lot of academies now you got you got over a thousand people to feed, but the idea of lunch hour. That's, wither, that's withering away, it always withered away. And, you know, it's quite often in the reality is children have got around 20 minutes to come in, queue up, eat and go. To let the next year group come in and the lunch breaks are staggered. So, you know, how do you take advantage of that? But I think, I think thinking of food education as a whole, thinking of, you know, the whole school food approach rather than isolate in isolation to the meal time um, is a way to tap into those debates essentially and, and key messages around healthy eating um, and not just healthy eating learning about different cultures you know that actually these ideas that you have to eat with a knife and fork and that's the proper way of eating and, you know this is what I mean about school food policy being quite classed gendered racialized um, newly arrived individuals, families, migrants who might have been used to eating with their hands, for example. And that could be a formalized way of eating in their communities. And I mean you know, and what we're serving as well. You know, we need to be much more uh diverse in terms of having more options. So I think, you know, that has in that, that has massive impact on um exclusionary issues. So for example Often read papers which which talk about uh, children bringing in food from home and you know certain smells being associated with that and not very pleasant and then issues around bullying and things like that. So you know it's I think we need to start to normalise more of different ways of eating and types of food. So you know there's more exposure for all actually. Um, so in terms of recommendations from three perspectives, firstly policy. I think it needs to be much more of a prioritisation of the school meal as a site for supporting public health concerns because we're investing in, you know, in, in, in kind of citizens of the future. Um, you know, there's a, with the obesity crisis. Again, there's a potential missed opportunity. Uh, we can take the pressure off services if we're teaching good food education. Um, that's the claim. School leadership, again, I mentioned it has to be, they have to, we have to see leaders, school leaders championing food education um, and supporting and shaping those culinary capitals that can be developed. 
in terms of engagement, who are the users, who are the stakeholders, right? We need to create, make sure we keep them in mind when we're designing, recreating food education, curriculums, um, school dining spaces, etc. Because otherwise it ends up you know, being created as a space just for managing behavior. And there are, you know, um, it, is a, it is a challenging time of day, but there are also ways in which we can make good use and share positive messages around food. The Taste Education, Food Education Charity, we believe learning about food should be more carrot, less stick. Um, and again, there's a number of organisations I've been working with, Taste is one of them. A number of organisations who are working, you know, um, third sector, charity, policy, think tanks, all trying to push for better meals for all, um, you know, from debates around sustainability to growing, to feeding. Just recognize, sorry, I'm going to move my slides along. Sorry, that was a commensality slide. Recommendations. I'll share these slides after anyway. Um, taste Ed. These are the organizations uh, I mentioned. I'm also involved in the All Party Parliamentary Group for School Food, where I typically go and present my research um, just to make sure that voices are being heard. And some references from the session. Thanks for your patience. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you.